Now let's look at the witch's goddess, because this is how paganism survived in Europe. It was very definitely associated with witches, particularly women, but anyone who is engaged in anything pagan. I mean, this stands to reason. This, these are the pre-Christian traditions. And there are folk names. In this case, we're looking at Frau Perta. And this is from 1486 out of a book. This is actually a demonological text. The, but you see her face actually, not only as a crone, but in the form of the carved wooden faces. We'll see this a little bit later. I think I have them in this show of the Perchten, which are still worn in Austria. They're the Perchtenlaufen, the ceremonial races in the winter nights ceremonies. So there are these long connections that even now persist in the folk tradition. But I want to go back to 906 because we can, this is the first piece I've found that specifically begins in Western Europe, this, this form of the women who go by night with the goddess. And this is a bishop in Western Germany, and he's telling priests to watch out for evil women who go with the goddess Diana by night. This use of Diana to stand in for other local goddesses is something that scholars refer to as the interpretatio romana. Everything has to be strained through Roman nomenclature. Roman concepts it has to be in Latin, otherwise it's not valid. But you've got this uh, evil woman concept that we saw earlier in the Vulvaspa, which actually probably dates to around this time. A redescription, a recasting of the wise women now are evil. Their power is threatening, but here they're very specifically described as in the company of a goddess. And here we go again a little bit later. And this is a Frankish bishop. He's in Italy, but um, this is a Germanic traditions, as far as I can see in, in the origin point, talking about how many people revered Diana or Herodias, whom they call queen or rather goddess. And he says that one third of the world is subject to her, mostly credulous little woman. This is a really important meme because it passes on for the next couple hundred years, one third of the world. The idea that again, women primarily are believing in this goddess who flies through the heavens with witches. I wanna to come to Herodias a little bit. As I was saying, they primarily use Diana as the cover name for all these different goddesses of different ethnicities. But the word Herodias starts to be introduced. And this is an element that comes out of the Christian Bible, the demonization of the dancer Herodias, who most of us know as Salome. But the mother is Herodias, the daughter is also named Herodias. And this is, this is out of the old world of ancient Palestine. And she's the one who dances in return for the head of John the Baptist. So she's a demonized figure in the Christian Bible. But she becomes the figure of the trance dancer and also assimilated to the pagan goddess. This is from the Utrecht Psalter, so coming out of the Netherlands, which was very completely Christianized in the 800s. And you have a half-naked woman dancing on a boulder. So she's out in nature next to a tree that has a serpent in it. She's hung her cape on the tree. This witch's cape is going to come up when we look at the witch's flight. And there are garlands hanging off the tree and a cornucopia and a libation vessel that's pouring out offerings of oil or wine. She's being approached by naked men who are, maybe this one's a woman, but they all look like men to me, who are adoring her. And this is what the priests are saying. So they're adoring Diana. They're adoring Herodias. These pagans, we have, to be, we have to stop them. And over here, you see the overlords looting out a treasury. This is some of the action off the screen. But I want to stay here because there is a direct parallelism presented here. She's on her rock, and up here is Christ in glory on his rock inside of Mandorla. He's surrounded by uh, male angels only. And the only other female in this whole picture is this bare-breasted woman who is approaching the Jesus figure and is being dragged away from him by this angel. So there's a whole demonization of females, goddesses, and women's power in that piece of art. But that piece about one third continues along. And even into close to 1300, there is this line from uh, a play called uh, Roman de la Rose. It's a poem, actually. 
many people foolishly believe that they are taken wandering with Lady Habon. So this is Abondia, the, the goddess of abundance. And they say all over the world, every third child is in this condition that they are taken with the goddess. They go three times a week as if destiny had led them to it. This is a little bit more like a, a spirit selection that certain people have the power to fly over the nations. And here's the French, and there's an ambiguity to these different forms because this one says the one third of the nation, but it could also mean the third born because this word nation, of course, comes from birth. It's really unclear from Old French, which is meant the third child that is born or the third child of the nation. Any, all of these stories that begin with Regino and Raterius and some of these other theologians talking about women who go with Diana really coalesces in a passage that later becomes the, called the Canon Episcopi, which means the bishop's rod. So it's a really, the concept of canon law is punishment. The rod was used to whip people by the Romans, especially women were whipped with rods by the pater familius. And so were the Vestal Virgins by the Pontifex Maximus, actually. Anyway, here's the verse. Certain abandoned women, perverted by Satan, seduced by illusions and phantasms of demons, believe and openly profess that in the dead of night, they ride upon certain beasts with the pagan goddess Diana. And in the silence of the dead of night, fly over vast tracts of country and obey her commands as their mistress. This theme of women who go by night with the goddess continues along in folk tradition, in the fairy faith tradition, especially the le bon dame, as they say in uh, some of the French sources, bonheurs and others. Here's, here it is in another form. This, this is the, the Latinate form of it, but in the Corrector Borchardi, this German penitential book, in the section directed to, uh, to stamping out the folk beliefs. Instead of saying Diana, he says, women who ride on certain animals on special nights in the company of she who common folly calls the witch Holda. And now instead of it's women who fly with the goddess, it's a throng of demons who look like women. So they're shifting the narrative, but it's very important that in, instead of Diana, he says Holda, because this signals to us a whole body of Germanic tradition Frau Hola, Frau Holda, Frau Holt, the lady of the mountain in Hesse. She's associated with the birth of babies out of ponds and with snowfall. She's a weather maker. She's a ripener of apples and a baker of bread. There's all these women's folk traditions that are bound up with her, but now she is being equated with Satan. But it's very important to see that when they're talking about Diana in the priestly writings, we can plug in from various traditions, various ethnic traditions. Hola in the Southern Germanic world, she's Berta or Perta. In the French world, Abundia becomes Dame Habond, Lady Abundance. Even in Italy where Diana originates, we have Lady East, Signora Orients, Signora del Buon Gioco, Lady of Good Play. They, the common people began calling their goddess by other names. The, the by names were important because it was a way of hiding from the priests what they were doing. And we also see the transformation of religious festivals like Epiphania, so that would be January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany. This name itself comes out of words for divine appearance out of the ancient Greek world. But on Italian tongues, get, this gets turned to Befana. And up to this very day, you have celebration of Befana in those same winter night holidays. So they successfully paganized a lot of Christian traditions so they could continue with their festivals. And then uh, another figure in the Low Countries, Verelda, becomes Faraildus in Latin. And in Scotland, we have Nickniven, which is the daughter of Ben Nevis, the tallest mountain in Scotland. This is one of the forms of the crone goddess, and so is the Geirkalen, the, the, the spinning crone. This is a map I did to try and map goddesses who are not just the pagan goddesses, but specifically goddesses associated with the company of witches, spirits, and ancestors who fly over the land, uh, especially on certain pagan nights. 
the mid, whether it's Midsummer's Eve or the Winter Nights or whatever it may be. And sometimes this one here, you can see in Galicia, she takes the form of a saint. Here's Madi of the Basques, the fairy queen and the queen of Elfame, well known to most students of, of British tradition, but also Queen Mab, which is related to Maeve in the Irish. Uh, Una as the lady of the underworld in some of the Irish traditions. There's our Mongfin Anya of the Midsummer's Eve processions with Cliars, the torchlit processions, and other kinds of processions like that also in uh, the Slavic world around goddesses, uh, Kostroma, she of the flax weaving. So there's a lot of depth to these stories. Shepason, the fair lady, who is also called Luca. This is Hungarian tradition. A lot of these goddesses are associated with the winter nights. Here's Hecate, who survives in Greek tradition. So the Basque world, Mari, and this is a drawing from the 1930s. She's flying along through the air next to the peaks that were sacred to her. She's called Lady of Amboto, which is a mountain with caves inside of it. The sacred caves and peaks are the places she lives. And the witches are said to assemble in those during the witch trials that we see going on, in, especially in the 1500s in Basque country. She's flying and she's spinning. She's got possibly a spinning wheel, maybe a clock, maybe a wheel, not entirely clear. But these sacred peaks become associated with the goddess of the witches. And so what happens in Italy is that the old Cumayan Sibyl, the prophetess around Naples in the ancient Roman world, who is remembered in folklore, carried along, ends up becoming Sapiente Sibilia, the Sibyl, who lives in a cave on a high mountain where seekers travel to visit her. This is my painting of her. She's in the Apennine Mountains. There's an actual cave that is said to be her dwelling place. And she lives there with serpent fairies and they are all teachers to seekers of the magic arts there in their cavern. And this is tied to the story of Tannhäuser, if you know about the opera, German traditions of the Venusberg. There's a goddess who lives immortally inside the underworld caverns. And magicians come to find that place and make their way into the cavern and frolic in feasting and lovemaking and music and joy where one year passes as a day or as a century. If they're out of the time-space matrix. So this takes us totally into the realm of fairy where you, know, you think you were just gone for one night and you come back and centuries have passed. And there's, there's a lot of fairy along those lines. But in Italy, this mountain is sometimes envisioned as at being at the center of a labyrinth. There's a mystic journey that you have to undertake in order to successfully reach the grotto of Sibylla and to receive these mystic teachings. Here she is inside of the labyrinth in her serpent or her dragon form. Sibylla also makes her way into witch trials where you see uh, her present as the lady, La Signora del Corso. This is, word has a lot of meanings, as you can see here. And she has the power to resurrect. So when the witches banquet on cattle that they have stolen, then she, they gather up the bones of the animals into their skins. And when she touches it with her wand, the animals are refleshed and they come back to life. They leap back up. You also see this witch's goddess touching bottles and baskets and renewing the bread and wine that they're feasting on. This is all a mystical form of the old pagan festivals, the old peasant festivals, bonfires, dancing, feasting, all in some wild natural place. This witch trial in the Piemonte region of Northwestern Italy, you can see the date there, People say that the witches took this cattle, feasted on them, collected the bones, and when they wrapped them in the hide and pronounced the magical words, sorge ronzola, get up, bossy, would be the English equivalent, the cattle were revivified. This is a widespread story. We can see this all the way over in Latvia, which is very, very far away from this part of Italy, maybe a thousand miles or more. And you see witches sacrificing a cow to a goddess, earth demon. That's the language of the priest that wrote this down and able to bring the cow to life. Anyway, the names for fairies all become 
uh, coalesced out of the name for Diana in many traditions. So in Latin, Dianae becomes Dianas. And then because in many languages, Di becomes Ja. So we have Janas, Yanari, Shanas in Asturias, Spain, La Dian in France, and even an oath in Auvergne, Per Diano Nero, by Black Diana. Or the name Zina for Diana in Romania later on becomes Zina, and this is the word fairies. And this conflation of goddesses and fairies and women who dance with the goddess are all put together here. This is another rather late penitential, 1320, leading the dances with the goddesses of the pagans, who in our vulgar tongue are called elves. So it's all getting mixed up together. Here's a French passage from Guillaume d'Auvergne, bishop, about the mistresses of the night, that they are the good women and great gifts are presented by them to the houses which they visit. Especially they persuade the women. Yeah, again, women are the primary practitioners of this. And these are the fairy women who are also the ancestors. There are festivals on which these offering tables are laid out and people await the coming of, of the visiting spirits, or they do the same thing on the occasion of birth in order to influence a positive fate for the newborn. The wild ride of the witches as they go aloft with the goddess, both the name of the goddess and also the destination is varying each, each country. So in Ireland, in Norway, they talk about lightning thunder, the ride of, of lightning, the tregenda, or in Italy, Akelare, which means goat meadow in the Basque world, the Mehni Eliakin, the Har Harlequin's uh, mob in France, the old army or the wild host. These are all variations on the same concept. Germans talked about Walpurgisnacht. In Scotland, it was the Hallow Mass Raid, the ride on All Hallows Eve, and Andari in Corso, to go the path, to go the way in Italian. And each country had the destination. So the Blocksberg turns up in a lot of the witch trials in Germany. Blackula or Spakonafell, this is a name, it actually means the ravine of the prophetess, the prophet woman in Norway. And Ben Nevis, this is Nick Nevin's realm. The hill of the fairies in Ireland, Nocnahia, and Puesh de Elve in Aveyron. These are pretty much exactly the same thing. The Venusburg, here's a Latinization of it. Basque talked about the cave, the cave of Zugarramurdi. And the Akelari was celebrated here. You can see how gigantic this cave is. These are people down here. So a really good place to go out of sound and sight of priestly spies if you wanted to hold your old pagan rites. And Ireland points to the old megalithic monuments as caves that were uh, spirits would dwell within them and would come out on Samhain, on the New Year's Eve of the Celtic year. Every other world dwelling in Ireland was open at Samhain when the spirits of the dead were abroad in the land. So what we're looking at here is Shikruachan, which is associated with the Morrigan and also with fruits coming forth in winter. Again, entry in the fairy realm, you're out of our normal time space so that wonderful fruits can be brought forth even in the dead of winter. The pagan tree of Benevento People were said in the 600s to dance around the tree that there was a serpent, either a living serpent or a bronze effigy of a serpent. And the bishop has the tree chopped down and made into a chapel and the serpent melted down and made into uh, instruments for the mass. Nevertheless, the idea of this evergreen walnut tree, now associated rather than pagans, but with witches, continues so that there are inquisitorial trials where people are being interrogated under torture to get them to say, yes, yes, we flew across Italy and we landed in Benevento and there we danced around the witch tree along the shore of the Yanari, which is the word in that part of Southern Italy, uh, the Dianas. The persistence of all of this is just really stunning that they were able to continue 